uh, COVID wise, I have a couple of updates. One is if you have not seen this Washington Post article yet, <clears throat> I suggest you take a couple of minutes to read it, uh, basically saying that unfortunately, the system completely dropping long COVID process, uh, multiple clinics that took care of long COVID patients are all shutting down due to discontinuation of emergency funds. And uh, director of NIH had a, basically, it's a grave concern because the numbers are rapidly increasing um, and nobody knows what, what, who's gonna take care of those patients. Um, so unfortunately, my main concern is, um, as I'll see the next topic, is that we're, you know, there's no effective treatments, there's no effective uh, prevention, there is no effective management in essence, and there's no system in place to figure out how to do it. Uh, some of the trials that are ongoing will probably take a long time before anything gets conclusive. And my main concern is we beginning to see patients being denied, uh, healthcare insurance denying any COVID related uh, coverage. I had two patients in the last week uh, when that happened, basically the insurance just stopped paying for post-COVID care, which is kind of bizarre, um, but we'll have to see what happens. I'm assuming there's just gonna be a lot of um, different back and forth with different insurances, but I, I expect that, that there's gonna be an aggressive push away from acknowledging the condition and claiming that the care for this entity should be provided by primary care doctors under standard insurance and nobody will be allowed to do this side therapies like acupuncture or this other things that we know have some benefits. So, so that's a one uh, significant aspect. Um, the second is there's a seemingly in a rapid massive increase in COVID. We had 12 patients got sick last this week, including provider, our own Ashley got sick uh, quite severely actually with a lot of symptoms, barely moving and same with her wife, uh, lots like complete loss of taste and, and smell. So pretty severe case, both of them. Um, and then I had two other patients come down, one pretty young, the other one uh, pretty old with very severe cases. One ended up going to the hospital. I have not seen anything like this since at least a year ago. I don't know if it's a new different wave, it's just us, small local experience, but, um, and I've tried to locate data and it's not possible because the tracking has been discontinued by CDC somewhere around second week of May um, and there's no other easy, so I couldn't find any quick data and uh, DC had discontinued tracking too. So um, you may have seen that the China has a massive spike, upwards of 60 million people, um, and, and they're figuring out what to do with it, despite that they're not planning on calling this pandemic again. They're just gonna try to manage this. But I think what I'm trying to say is, um, if you're planning on traveling and you are more than say eight, six, eight months out of the booster, you should consider getting one. Because I, I have a fear is that those traveling since nobody wears masks anymore they're gonna you're gonna be at the higher risk if you're traveling um, other than that uh, i think use your own judgment when you go somewhere i think the risk is still much lower than let's say even six months ago uh, but nonetheless I, I think i think it's important to keep an eye around you um, hopefully you also gotten stuck up on uh testing materials since it's going to be a little harder to get them and they're going to cost some money. So that's all COVID updates I have. So let's see what questions we get. Yeah, so what I'm saying, I see a major spike in, in on our clinic all around us. Um, we had a long COVID class yesterday and we had four people in a long COVID class whose friends or relatives gotten sick in the last week. So it sounds like pretty much anybody I talk to suddenly know about somebody who got sick in the last week or two, which has not been the case. Again, in a lack of actual formal statistics, I don't know what to make of this. Maybe we're having something local in district area. Um, maybe it's something else. Uh, and I'm talking about positive cases. So I'm not talking about people who get acute respiratory virus, test negative, and then 
say something because you know you could theoretically still have some of those cases positive although i think those are all mostly rsv um, and then also this new virus that you probably all heard about right um and i can't pronounce it i need to pull it up one second anybody knows what i'm talking about it causes the pretty severe rsv like upper respiratory symptom uh, but it's new and it's um it's called human let's see human meta pneumonovirus hmpv uh apparently it's common virus but in the past it wasn't causing severe symptoms and apparently now it has so what i'll do is i'll put the link i'll put the name and then i'll put the link to the CNN article if anybody wants to read about it. I have not done my due diligence to dig deeper in this one. I was just reading about this yesterday and I got too busy to research this more. But I'll uh, I'll have to research this. CDC suspended uh, because the emergency rule ended on uh, May 11. All the funding has been discontinued. So the CDC site that managed the data their, their funding got cut, so there's not going to be documentation. So if you go to the CDC website, um, the week, weekly review signing off, it says that the last publication was on May 12, which is the day after emergency rule was ended. So. All right. My vaccine was back in September, so I think, it, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So consider right now to get a booster, if you, especially if you're going to travel. Uh, if you're not going to travel, you're going to have more controlled environment. I think you can probably wait longer. Shirley, you have a hand raised? Yes, I just wanted to um, make a comment about reinfections. If, from what I see from going around, most people have just kind of gone back to pre-pandemic behavior. So if you're kind of mingling around with people who may be infected, who are you know close, we no distance, we don't have masks, people are all up in your face, wouldn't you kind of, be um opening yourself up for transmission you know to to get the thing um I, i'm not sure i'm 100 following can you repeat it <laughs> i guess what what i'm saying is if the virus is still around because covid is not gone even right. though some people are telling me covid's gone but it's really not gone if covid is still around and you're get you know bunchy clothes you're not masking you're exposing yourself to people that may have it wouldn't you get it at some point maybe opening yourself up to that yeah that's what I, that's what i'm thinking i'm thinking that the reason we're seeing the spikes is that you know we used to have at least some people were masking and now nobody does wherever you go so i mean there was an article yesterday that um FDA had a big meeting and then 181 person got sick there at the meeting. Like, you know, just, just because nobody is wearing any masks. So I think we're gonna start seeing this. The question is why all of a sudden we're we seeing a more, more severe cases. That gets me a little concerned because, you know, now the strains are not tracked, nothing is tracked. We don't actually know what's gonna happen. Um, so I'm, simply expressing concern. I, I don't have any particular answers. And I, I also don't think I can research much here because we're just going to have to wait and see what's going to happen next, I, I'm afraid. Well, I think people still need to be cautious about this thing. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. I, I mean, we need to got this question exactly to that point. Some protocol relative to, you know, when you go out and when you think you should mask or not, a lot of people now just think it's, it's you don't have to do anything. So they're in crowds, people all up in your face. They're, you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a, we're free kind of thing. I think you should feel comfortable wearing masks whenever you feel cold to. Like, don't be afraid of looking weird. Um, I'm not. I wear my mask, but you know, I'm not wearing. But I, but I found, I found that I'm a little less cautious now because so many people aren't wearing it. So. I find myself not wearing it as much. Right, right. Well, uh, that's, that's my that's my main point. 
exactly that 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 almost no one like i'm wherever i go nobody's wearing any masks except basically the only places left where people wear masks are the healthcare system the clinics and the hospital like i was on call last week and most staff were wearing masks although most patients in the rooms were not and the family but the staff was so i mean there are some places where people stay, and i occasionally see masking in some places like you know, like I went to a bank today and two people in the two workers in a bank were masking, but it's like less of more of an exception. And yeah, a lot of practices have actually dropped requirement. Uh, some places beginning to sort of say, well, if you feel like masking mask, but we're not going to mandate it. So it's kind of like that. And a lot of people, even at MFP, are not wearing masks anymore. So we're basically getting it's getting more and more lax as we go. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to start getting infected all of us again because of that. So um, it's a good article. Um, who posted the that NIH poured a billion into long COVID and there's nothing to show for it. That's a, you know, that's an interesting statement. So that's by uh, Stat News. I think the link was by, was it L? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I have some <laughs> a little more positive news. Uh, the practice that I'm going to do later today, I will put the link on. I, I pre-recorded something on YouTube that's shorter. So we'll we'll talk about some of the techniques we can do to improve our own um, respiratory function and, and as such decrease risks of um, complications. Okay, so uh, Ellen. Do you want to take over? Thank you, Misha. That was very sobering. <laughs> you know, if I, that's what's going on. Um, hi, everybody. It's so nice to be back here with you. I, I'm uh, very appreciative to be invited back. And um, I thought that it might be helpful to talk about how to beat the heat with food. Uh, we don't usually think about that. I mean, I think the in, kind of way people think about it is I'll have a, some iced tea, you know, or some cold water or something. But there are a lot of um, ways that you can adjust how you're eating in summer, which is what we're in, kind of pre-summer, um, to help your body regulate. And I, I made a little slideshow because I just thought, you know, it might be helpful just to see some things. Um, so let me pull that up. Hold on. Share my screen. Okay. All right, there we go. So eating to beat the heat. Um, and you know, I just want you to think about it for a second. You know, how do you adjust your eating as the seasons change? You know, your cooking styles change. Does your appetite change? Does your energy change? Do your choices of foods change? You know, you don't have to answer me right now. We might have a little conversation about it later, but you know, it's just something that I wanted to bring up to think about because in our, my practice of Chinese medicine, this is from the classical text of Chinese medicine, the Yellow Emperor's classic. This statement, which I really love, it says from ancient times, it's been recognized there's an intimate relationship between the activity and life of human beings and their natural environment. You know, and I think we all know that um, for so many different reasons, we've become a little bit more disconnected from our natural environments. Um, technology, of course, COVID locked us in for a while. And, it's, you know, even now, some of us are still like re-emerging from that. Um, you know, nature is less accessible in different areas, you know, where you live. There may not be a park or trees or you know, enough trees or whatever, you know, we're not, we have these devices that take us away from the present moment. So, you know, when we have a relationship with something, whether it be our environment, our natural environment, or the food we eat, you know, we have to become acquainted with it a little bit. We have to, you know, because that's what intimacy is, right? You, you're acquainted with your object uh, of relating to. So, you know, and we can do that with our food. And it helps us kind of participate more fully in a season, you know, because if you're weighted down and you're feeling super hot, 
it's really hard to be in a hot environment. And, you know, we're just going to see more and more heat, you know, with climate change. So I just really thought it might be good to talk about it a little bit. So, you know, when it's hot, we've got to adjust. Our bodies are like self-regulating mechanisms when we're functioning. And um, we are able to sweat to get rid of heat, uh, to cool down. We're able to retain heat because, you know, it's not going to be hot forever. It's going to get to be cold sometime. And you don't want to be so cold inside that when weather changes, you're just not up to it. But when it is hot, it's really important that we stay hydrated because we do sweat more, right? And we need to support really good digestion. And um, sometimes in the heat, people may lose appetite. But, you know, there's also the summer, which is like grilling and, you know, people drink beer and it's ice cream time and ice drinks and all of that. But that isn't always you know, there's a counterintuitive way of how we can regulate our own heat. So we need to be able to be cool. We need to retain our warmth. And, you know, it's the abundant time of year. So there's tons of fruits and vegetables. And I say, let's partake. So here we have, you know, blueberries and raspberries that are really abundant in this time of, time of year. They're, they're sweet, they're sour, and that sour flavor, you know, it just has so much hydration. It has so many wonderful antioxidants and, and benefits for us. Um, so I just wanted to show that little picture there. And again, just like inspiring us to partake um, out of our beige foods, if we're eating those kinds of foods, into color, you know, really getting color on our plate, getting color every day in our foods, you know, because part of eating is, it's the taste, right? We want delicious food, but we, we also, it's a sensory thing. So we want to partake with all our senses, with the smell, with our sight, with the texture, you know, and how we're preparing things. So some of these foods are just wonderful in summer, especially like celery, very cooling and hydrating, um, cherries, of course, uh, strawberries, raspberries. And next to the raspberries, you see kind of a bumpy um, round fruit. That's a lychee um, in Chinese medicine. But in, if, you, if you're near Chinatown, you know, you can get lychee and they're marvelous. They're very, very refreshing. You just take off the shell and it's uh, kind of spongy. Tomatoes, of course, very sweet and sour, very cooling. Carrots, just great for the eyes. Eggplant, you know, all of it. Look at all the colors here. So, you know, when you're eating, you just want to say, hey, can I, what kind of color can I get on my plate? Because you're going to feel much more um, satisfied. So here are just some kind of, um, guidelines, you know, we want to support our body's capacity to regulate heat, like I said, so hydrating foods, cooling foods, and calming foods, because summer is this very exuberant time, you know, we've got a lot of activity, we're out there, we're out in the sun, and, you know, we need to have the balance of that, we need to be able to kind of calm down and, you know, contain ourselves a little bit uh, for our own energy, etc. And, you know, your cooking can get lighter, you can steam you know, you can steam vegetables and then make a nice dressing for them. You can eat some more raw foods if you can digest that well. Um, herbal teas are really great. Like I love to take, and I'll show you a picture later. Um, you know, I love to just take mint leaves and stick them in some water and drink that. That's very, very cooling. Mint is very cooling. It's very refreshing. Lemon is such as well. Um, and, you know, if you're a meat eater, uh, meat takes a lot of energy and to digest. So when you when you use energy in the body to digest, it actually warms your body up more. So there's a technique, you know, or, you know, if you if you're a person who grinds your meat, that's a really good technique because it helps the breakdown of the meat, so it's easier to digest. In uh, Asian countries, they'll have you know a, kind of a, a rich meat or fish, and then they'll have some radish with it or some ginger, and that kind of pungent helps break through the fat, makes it more easy to digest. And like I said earlier, you know, it's counterintuitive, but having like room temperature or warm liquids actually is easier on your body because if food is really cold, your body actually has to generate energy to warm it up so that you can break it down, et cetera. So if some foods that are too heating, I just made a list here, you know, some spicy foods are really good, but if you're a person who puts spicy, 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 spicy on everything it might be a little bit too much because spicy foods heat you up, but they also help you sweat. So you want to kind of just balance it out a little bit. 
you know, too much rich food, of course, is hard and that, that'll make you warmer inside. Too much meat, maybe now's the time to have a little bit more fish or poultry or plant-based protein. Um, too much alcohol, very warming. And then ice cream and ice, like I said, because it's, it's too cold. And, and ice cream, of course, is creamy. It's got sugar. So your body has to really work hard to kind of break it down. So, you know, you've got these health challenges in the summer. You know, you've got like heat exposure, especially in DC, you've got that humidity. Um, and you can feel kind of lethargic. You know, it's like hard to get moving. You know, that damp kind of uh, can't get out from under it. Some people get some headaches from the heat or feel nauseous even like low grade fever, you know, just feeling too hot. So these are some of the challenges that we can kind of be aware of. And you just have to know yourself, you know, are you that kind of person who's very sensitive to heat? Of course, staying out of the heat in the hot time of the day, you know, wearing a hat or having an umbrella or something just so that you're not um, subject to so much of it. So let's get into some foods. Like this is just a nice, simple recipe that I make. Um, where I take radishes, which are filled with water, so they're very hydrating, and I boil them or steam them, and you can do that with cauliflower too. And I take the radish tops, which are kind of spicy, and you wash them off, and you can, um, you can put some salt on them, or in this recipe, I use a little sauerkraut juice, and just let them sit overnight. And then you just kind of put them on these very simple, plain vegetables, and it's it's nice because it's kind of a fermented food, which is really good for your microbiome and your digestion. And you've got these nice um, you know, foods. Whenever you steam, you're gonna put more water into your food. So that helps with any kind of hydration. Okay, counterintuitive again. Why do I wanna eat soup in the summer? That doesn't make any sense. But soups are filled with water. So they're enormously hydrating. And in my uh, ancestral background, uh, from Ukraine, you know, borscht is like the national soup. So this is a, um, a vegan type of soup. And there's the recipe that, you know, I know you can get the recording so you can make this. This was in my book too. And it's just a lovely, light, refreshing soup, you know, with a little um, yogurt or sour cream on top, a little sprig of dill. It's just nice. It's nourishing. Beets are very good. They're rich in iron. So that's a nice thing to have or any kind of soup that you have that you may make a cooling soup like um, potato leek soup without the cream, you know, and you can make that a nice thing with vegetable stock and blend it up or people have gazpacho or, or things like that. So that's, that's an option. And, you know, you need protein, right? Um, in, the, in the summer, you need protein all the time. And mung beans, uh, which are traditional mostly in Asia, are used uh, traditionally in summertime to help clear heat. Um, so they're cooling, people make a broth, you can get them as sprouts in a store, you can make them in with rice. Um, and so mung beans are a nice thing or any kind of beans, uh, a nice bean a vegetable soup is a, is a good thing to do. Um, so that's an idea. And tea, you know, coffee, I know people love their iced coffee and, um, you know, I don't say don't drink coffee, coffee's great, but um, it's very warming, you know, coffee beans are roasted, so it's a little bit more drying. And same with black tea, it's a little bit more warming and drying, but green tea, rich in polyphenols, antioxidants, um, you know, is slightly bitter in flavor, it's very cooling and it's very refreshing. So you can make a green tea, you can make an herbal tea, let's see here, you can use flowers in tea. You know, you have jasmine. Um, sometimes people put rose in tea. Um, some people put lavenders in tea, you know, or chamomile. They're very refreshing and cooling, and they're also very calming. So as an herb, and they're, you know, benign, they're not, you're not going to hurt yourself with these, with these herbs at all. So you can make teas with these combinations of flowers, um, or you can just look around and see what kind of flowered teas there are. I like them without the flavors because, you know, even they say natural flavors, eh, you know, who knows what their natural flavors are. I just like the flower itself. Really, really good idea. Um, so here's that beautiful mint, you know, mint, spearmint, they're all different kinds of mint. If you live in an apartment, you can grow them in a pot on your windowsill. And it's just fun. You know, you get to put that mint off 
you can dry it and um, just tie it up and dry it so you have it in the winter time. Or like I said, um, you know, sometimes I'll blend it up with some lemon juice and water and drink that. And that's super refreshing. You can put a little honey in it or a little bit of sugar if you like that for like a nice, um, a nice tea. Some people make sun tea where they put the mint in the water and let it sit outside in, in the hot sun. And by the end of the day, you have some really nice long brewed tea. So that's an option. Also, lemon is very refreshing, very cooling. Watermelon, of course, is like the quintessential summer vegetable. And it is um, in Chinese medicine and nutritional therapy, it's the coldest fruit there is. In fact, in, uh, in that tradition, you don't eat it past a certain time because it's too cold. So, you know, having watermelon in winter may remind you of summer, but it's first of all, it's not that good because you know the best watermelon is like grown close to you. And um, watermelon has an interesting history, originating in South Africa, migrating up north into Egypt, and then through the slave trade, making its way to the Caribbean and to the Americas. But you know, you can have a watermelon plain if you like. Uh, some people put a teeny bit of cayenne on it. Um, just to kind of give it a little bite. I like to blend it with a little bit of pomegranate juice and a teeny bit of rose water and lemon. And that makes a lovely refreshing summer drink. So watermelon is like when it's hundred degrees and humid, if you just eat watermelon, it's okay. It's okay, you'll feel nice and cool. Um, so let's see here. I just wanted to introduce uh, sea vegetables. I don't know if any of you eat them or, or know about them, but um, every coastal community in the world has eaten sea vegetables. And, okay, wait a minute, let me go back. And so here are some of them. Nori, you might know if you ever eat sushi, you know, that it's wrapped around the sushi and uh, very high in protein as a sea vegetable. Arame is very kind of bland. I, there'll be a recipe next that has an arame like topping for a salad. Kombu is kelp and it's, um, all of them are very high in minerals, calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus, uh, dulse, uh, the one on top is uh, rich in iron. Wakame is also in Japanese uh, cooking in uh, miso soup. It's a very nice way they'll make it with a, a um, cucumber salad. And cucumbers are incredibly cooling. Okay, so here's the recipe. It's just a simple salad. You kind of just let it, you soak it, and then you put some herbs, chives and parsley, lemon, little oil, and salt, and then you can just um, put it on top of a salad or have it with um, you know, a bowl of rice and vegetables. It's uh, got a nice texture and it's so nourishing. I, I really love them and I'm always trying to get people to eat them. So if you haven't tried sea vegetables, look around for them. They're in, they're in a lot of grocery stores now, um, but I, what I like about them is they're just, they're really rich in minerals and our food is not mineralized enough. Just demineralized soils, et cetera. So that's an option. And then I don't know if any of you have ever tried bitter melon. I mean, it is in the Asian tradition, but it's also in the Caribbean tradition. Um, yeah, so it's a super bitter food. There's been a, quite a bit of research on it, actually in the use of diabetes, but with extracts, et cetera. Um, but I have a recipe in, in my book, Nutritional Healing with Chinese Medicine, that makes a relish. So you can um, you mix it with some miso, which is a fermented soybean paste and some tomatoes. So you have that bitter, that salty, that sour and sweet. So kind of getting like, like a lot of the flavors in there. And um, anyway, I just threw it in there because I like to introduce unusual foods to people. <clears throat> and that's me. And so I'm gonna stop sharing and I wanna see what questions you have. Let's see, okay. All right, whoa, 12, let me see what's happening. Okay, um, bye -bye. and I eat borscht at room temperature. Um, sometimes if, it, if I have leftovers, I'll put it in the fridge, but yes, Misha, you probably, that's an exclamation like, yes, you eat borscht cold, but you can also eat it hot. Um, there are also traditions where you make it with like a beef stock and you make put cabbage in it, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, as someone with a form of dysautonomia, 
autonomia because heat had ex I've discovered power age zero. Okay, as our foods with salt, right? Pickles, soups, steamed vegetables with salt, watermelon, lentils, and like mung beans, etc. Yeah. So that salt, you can even put the salt on the watermelon. Um, fermented foods will have salt. You know, you don't really want to add salt at the table so much, but having fermented foods also really good for your digestive system, gets all those um, beneficial bacteria back into your gut, helps your digestion. Uh, yes, electrolytes, sugar-free brands. You know, the sugar-free brands, I don't know what they are. I mean, sugar-free means you just don't use any sweetener of any kind. So that's why it's just, it's so much cheaper and it's easier to add a little lemon or some mint, or even to say make a cup of mint tea if you don't have fresh mint and then um, you know, make a big pitcher of it and stick it in the fridge or let it just cool down. Because you know, those uh, artificial sweeteners aren't that great for us um, really. They don't have much benefit. So right, mint sprig, is it better to eat mung bean sprouted? No, it's not better. You can eat them either way. Um, sprouts, of course, are very fresh. So you get that, you know, eating is not just medicinal, it's like pleasure too. So, you know, that, that texture element, that crunchiness. So if that's the way you like to eat them, I say enjoy them. Dulse flakes, smoothies, yes. Great source of iodine. Of course, if you're hyperthyroid, you want to watch that. And definitely, um, Jeanette said, you know, touch of salt does intensify the flavor. Oh, and she has a watermelon aqua fresca recipe. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe I'll, I don't have it right now, but I can get you my watermelon juice recipe um, as well. As Kerala, bitter melon is quite bitter. Yes, it is the most bitter vegetable there is. Um, you know, in Asia, you have a tradition of eating it when you're a kid, so you learn how to love it. And it is something you have to learn how to love because in our culture, we don't eat so much bitter vegetables. Um, we eat bitter through coffee, chocolate, and beer. So, you know, bitter vegetables you can get in um, dandelion greens, artichokes, asparagus, white asparagus, cardoon greens, um, white grapefruit, you know, but any kind of dark leafy green is going to be great for you. Any advice for those? Uh, yeah, glycine intake through bone broth, great. Who can't really do citrus at all. If you can do like a rice vinegar, um, you know, there are these drinks called shrubs or drinking vinegars. If you want to try that, those are some good. Um, but if you're if you're sensitive to acidic foods then and vinegars in that sensitivity, then I guess that's okay. You can just leave this, the citrus out. I'm trying to think another, can you do like pomegranate? Like pomegranate juice is a little bit sour or like uh, hibiscus or rose hips. Um, yeah, and lemon is actually alkalizing, um, but you may, you know, everybody's different. That's the thing I think. You know, foods, some foods are, we go, that's a really good food, but not for everybody because everyone metabolizes, digests, and absorbs in a different kind of way. So we have to be true to what works for us as well. So, okay, I think that's it. Wait, do I, but I have an issue with everything above. Oh, yeah. What kind of issue? An issue of sensitivity, AI says. Yes, that's hard. Um, well, I hope you're getting help with that so that, you know, seeing how your body can adjust so that you can eat foods in a way that nourish you and makes you feel good. I mean, some people are incredibly sensitive to many different things for all kinds of reasons. So like I said, we have to honor our own constitution, our own condition and see how to work with that. But I hope you can have some berries or cherries or things like that so okay i think uh i think i'm going to say thank you so much and misha and i'll thank you okay thank you alan um while you were giving the talk in the spirit of an actual healthcare, since i'm at the office tiffany hoyt just 
give some marks and put some needles in me because I've uh, I've been stressed lately. So oh, I'm so glad you're getting. I that. feel I feel a lot more grounded um, and prepared for leading. The and, and you know what? There's a smile on your face now, Misha, where there wasn't in the yeah, beginning. That's right. That's so right. I'm happy to see that. That's great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm following. Um, on the since I had to prepare something pretty quickly, what we're going to do is what I've already prepared. Um, and yesterday we had a long COVID class, and we talked a lot about the importance of the different types of breathing, and particularly we we talked about strengthening the, the diaphragm. I think it's okay if I give you a link to the. We did a recording of the class, so if anybody wants to see the whole presentation with a lot of details, I'll give you a link to that. But also there's a link to uh, a, a much shorter version of the box breathing that we're going to do today. So I'm going to put two links. So this first link is a um, one hour long coded class on breathing. So, and then, uh, and then I'm going to put the link to box breathing. Box breathing is relatively a simple technique. You will, uh, if you already know, and if you've done it before, you're going to find it, um, you know repetitive for you since you've already done it uh, the technique is is quite old and it's been recently popularized by uh on huberman's podcast he had a whole episode on breathing it's a very long podcast i think mean, two hours i believe and um he discussed discussed the actual uh, box breathing there in great detail so i'm going to put the link to that as well and um, so the second link is much shorter. So if you forget and you need something and you don't want to watch this whole episode, uh, you're going to have that short link and, and I'll, we'll make sure that we're also going to post the links to the when we post this video as well. Um, so why box breathing, first of all? Um, well, you can think about different um, healthcare principles of each breathing technique, right? So you have remember probably some of you, me teaching several ones like four, seven, eight breath, elemental breath. Um, so each breath has its own specific directions. For example, four, seven, eight, which is inhale on four, hold on seven and exhale on eight is thought to be relaxation technique or, or induction of a parasympathetic tone, very good for sleep. Um, the box breathing, which is literally what it means. So you inhale for a certain count, let's say an eight, um, well, eight is ambitious. Let's start with four. So you inhale on four, hold on four, exhale on four, and again, hold on exhalation. So the tricky part of the box breathing, and this is the hardest, it's to hold uh, a breath on exhalation. Uh, so in contrast to four, seven, eight, Benito is asking what that is. It's a type of a breathing. You inhale on four, you hold on seven after you inhale, exhale on eight and start inhaling again. In box, not only counts are different, so every side of the box is the same, but you hold on exhale. So you inhale on four, hold on four after inhale, exhale on four, hold after exhale on four, and then re restart the cycle. Um, I have this nice picture there on the video. Ready to step? Oh, no, that's not what I'm, <laughs> it's a, um, actually, I, I can't since there's a commercial. I'm not going to play it for now. But if you go to the to the second link, um, this one, you will see the actual on the actual video. You will see the picture. The thumbnail itself has the uh, box breathing diagram. Um, so the most important part of the box breathing, in contrast to something like four seven eight or lots of other techniques. Box breathing by default is a progressive technique. So you want to start with four. That's most people should be able to have no problem. So if you're doing four, 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 it's 16 seconds per breath, meaning you're doing about four breaths per minute. Most people should be able to do that comfortably. If you can drop down to three or even two, and I think doing two should be relatively easy. Now, if you increase the length from four to five, from five to six, et cetera. Uh, of course, if you get to something like eight, suddenly it's a, it's eight times four. So it's, it's two breaths per minute. That's pretty slow. 
um, you may struggle with that and you don't wanna get there right away. But, but the whole point of this practice is that you're gradually learning to prolong each section and getting adapted to the gases exchange. And here I'm gonna give you a reminder. We, we talked about this long time ago, at least a year ago, if not a year and a half, about importance of learning to be able to prolong holding after you exhale. So what's called an exhalation hold. The importance of exhalation hold is that instead of operating on oxygen, you exhale, and you a lot faster the CO2 starts rising before you reach out the situation of low oxygen. And so that desire to take a deep breath after you exhale has nothing to do with lack of oxygen. And in some ways, especially people who have any lung conditions where they breathe frequently and where their breath is shallow, they tend to out basically outbreathe all of the CO2 and, and they, they're in this state of what's sometimes described as too much ox oxygen. Well, you can't really be too much oxygen, but, but your ratio is shifting. So you have not enough CO2. And believe it or not, it's actually quite critical because the CO2 creates certain pH. And more importantly, if, if our receptors are not adapted to tolerate the CO2 rise, there are certain, um, triggers that are occurring, your breath sequence or your breath frequency increases. So when we talk about the value of a slow deep breathing, a lot of this has to do with being able to hold the breath after you exhale. Nestor in his book, Breath, which I also have a link in that video that I posted, has a, a whole chapter on the importance of this. And we've discussed this quite a bit. Uh, but this is the first practice where you can continuously, gradually practice getting yourself to that point where uh, after, say, eight counts or 10 counts, you're going to, um, to hold. So without further ado, I've talked enough. Let's do the practice. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do, you, you don't want to do this for more than about five minutes. Uh, probably the best timing would be somewhere between two to four minutes, two or three times a day. It's not a, it, the, the practice is not set to be done for an hour, for sure, or even for 10 minutes. Uh, you're going to feel the difference pretty quickly when you start. What I'm going to do is we're going to do it a little bit longer. We're going to do it for about closer to seven or eight minutes. We're going to start with four and we're going to get to six. If you're struggling, drop down to what's comfortable and stay there. So while I'm doing the counts in the beginning, you will be doing your own counts if you're struggling. If you can't keep up with the way I count, by all means. Um, thanks, Benita. It's exactly how Benita wrote it. So if you forget, just come back to um, the statement, inhale four, hold four, exhale four, and then hold for four again after you exhale, okay? So that's, that's the sequence. So let's, let's begin. You don't have to be seated. If you feel like you want to lay down, that's fine. I don't think the standing would work here. You want to be just comfortable. So take a inhale together. Exhale and begin. Inhale, two, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, and hold two, three, four, inhale, two, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, continue on your own pace for maybe two breaths, and then we'll move to five. Okay, let's move to five. So inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three, four, five. Exhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, four, five. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three, four, five. Exhale, two, three, four, five. Inhale, I'm sorry, hold, two, three, 
four, five. And now continue for two more breaths of five on your own. Okay, so now if you're comfortable moving on to six, let's move on to six. If you're not comfortable, just stay where you were comfortable. And then we'll do about maybe three or four minutes of the now of the six. And we're not going to go beyond the six. If you're comfortable and you like feel like going beyond six, be my guest. Just ignore my counts and do your own. And then when you restart at home, if you're going to choose to do this daily, just start where, where you end today. So whatever's comfortable at the end of this practice. So if you're comfortable at six, start at six and then see if you can grow it slowly. So let's start with six. Inhale. Six. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six. Exhale. Two, three, four, five, six. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhale. Hold, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six. And hold, two, three, four, five, six. Continue your own count. A couple of clarification while you're doing the practice. It's probably best to inhale and exhale through the nose. Second best is inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. When you're doing the holds, it's very important that you don't tighten the chest, you don't like the chest and diaphragm. So the both inhale and exhale hold should be pretty gentle. So you inhale and then without this, like you don't do this, you just kind of stop your breath in there and hold it. And the same when you exhale, just at the end of the exhale, you just kind of wait without, without any muscular contraction. And again, if you're starting to feel short of breath after, let's say, three, two, three cycles of six, go back down. So go to five, go to four, whatever you feel comfortable. And let's do another minute. So we'll do another uh, two breaths. Okay, so that's a whole practice. Um, again, don't overdo it. I'd love to hear experiences. Um, probably easiest to put the couple of words in the chat as to what, you, what you're feeling. Um, quick question, those of you who easy to raise the hands. Who feels a lot more tired after this? You see any hands? Like you suddenly feel like you need to go take a nap. Anybody feels like that? Mm -hmm. I've only seen one hand. Okay. I mean, that's pretty common you, you, for people, for those of us who are under more stress and kind of more driven, this practice can invoke this deep relaxation technique. But if you're not quite stressed or in the fast pace, actually, you're probably not going to, if anything, you can feel energized. I think Kathy had hands up. Okay. Breathing through the nose was easier. Okay, good. What, what else are you feeling? Anybody else feeling any other shifts, changes? Tired, but it's more due to the heat. Okay. Feel a little lightheaded at first, but then got better. Right. So that's a good point. Um, sometimes lightheadedness is going to happen because you're going to be holding breaths a lot. 
um, it's okay. I mean, it, 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 it's probably going to pass very quickly for most people. Don't speed up, don't rush increasing the length. Uh, make sure you're comfortable in each breath. So if you're holding the breath and at the end of the holding, you feel really kind of almost trying to gasp, it's too far. Like you need to finish each hold very comfortably. If you're struggling, it means you went a little bit beyond your current capacity. So. And again, I'll put the links, all the links are going to be shared, but again, I'm going to put the link to, if you just want to have a video that only shows the technique, then it's this one. Um, and the video itself, I think I actually put Huberman's link to the Huberman's long podcast, which is like two hours, Science of Breathing. So if you don't want to read the book, I think you can also listen to the podcast. Um, so that is all. Next reminder, next week, uh, I will be giving wellness talk and nature guide, Alana Rubin will lead the mind body practice. Very good. So um, I'm probably gonna talk about the new virus next week. I'm probably gonna take on researching this a little bit more. It's always good to stay updated about all kinds of new things that are potentially threatening us, even if it's transient and will not have any problems, which is what I expect, but still you want to have a good sense of what's out there well thank you everybody um we're ending a couple of minutes earlier unless there's some last minute burning questions or anything to ellen or i thank you ellen so much for coming um, oh ellen's still with us Hi, oh yeah i was gonna her. leave and then i thought ah. i have to catch a train but yeah thanks so much great to be with you and always happy to come back and talk about food <laughs> uh, and the website, her website link is there, but I'll repost it again. Thanks. If anybody, if and, anybody needs to catch that. Thank you. And I sent Jeanette my recipe for the watermelon beverage. So I don't know if you can get that to people because I couldn't put it in the chat. So yeah, uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll okay. cut and paste. Thank can you. A, can I ask a super bizarre question? My uh, 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 a 13 year old who's turning 14 next week he has this idea for his new company uh, those of you who've been following my work for a while he is uh, gonna be a professional chef he's already picking Ooh. culinary schools in spain and italy and already being interviewed by some etc wow oh. so but what he wants to consider doing is to start cooking cooking a couple of dishes maybe 20 or 30 portions and we will have a freezer at CIM and he'll just bring it and anybody will be able to buy it at relatively low cost. Um, so That's beautiful. The borscht, the borscht is actually one of the, or borscht and bone broth are the two potential foods that he's entertaining. And wow. of course he's learned to make borscht for more than 10, well, not 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago from his grandma. Yeah. So. so who would be, who would be interested if we, if we said something like this, who would be in, interested in purchasing occasional meals? <laughs> okay, well, there's a lot of logistical problems. He, he needs to cook at the certified kitchen for sale. So there's a lot of tricks here, but uh, he wants to have, have it happen. So we'll, we'll cool. support him. Nice. So. Misha, a lot of churches, uh -huh. other religious um, places of worship have uh, certified kitchens. That's what we're gonna. That's what exactly what what he's okay, starting. Great. What we're gonna do? We're gonna research. Uh, we may like basically have aim to support this somehow, not necessarily monetary, but like that the those kitchens will have like affiliate nonprofit that they're working with. Don't you have a teaching kitchen at the School of Medicine? Uh, I don't know how much well, access we have? Um, for that. I haven't had an update on that lately, but I think they're getting closer to building one. Unfortunately, oh. I think they're going to have to build it on the um, Virginia campus. Oh, okay. Oh, so Ashburn. So that's pretty far. Yeah, that's yeah. in the back of beyond. No offense, Ashburn, but it's the back. Right. No, no offense. Yeah. They're very close to uh, Dallas Airport, but it's a little <laughs> far from us. I think we're going to look for, there's a couple of churches in Silver Spring that have uh, been very community engaged in uh, different 
food-based initiatives. And yeah. uh, one of our AIMS um, new board member has a small food-based nonprofit. So we're also going to talk to him a lot. Oh, cool, cool. Steve. Nice. Uh -huh. All right, I'm going to say everybody. goodbye. Thank you. Take See you care. all next week. Enjoy. Yeah. Should be okay. a nice weather. Take care. Stay, well. Stay bye -bye. safe. Bye. bye. Have a good weekend.